Well, hello you. This is Shane from Shane's Books and Review, and I hope you are having a great day today. We made it to Friday. Small round of applause for ourselves. The book we're going to be talking about today, of course, is The Consuming Fire, wrote by John Scalzi. It is the second book in the series of The Interdependency. What a read that was. The first book that I read from John Scalzi, I have a friend of mine that's an electrician. I'm not going to do any name drops here because I don't want to put him out. It was John Scalzi, Old Man War. It blew my mind mind out of the water. I was absolutely not ready for that book. It did kick me off on reading a bunch of other books that were kind of the same type of a thing. So I owe this guy a little bit of gratitude for telling me to read it. On to the book. Ooh, where do we even start? There's so many pieces. All right, I want to say this. As a sequel, John Scalzi did a beautiful job with this book. A lot of times when you get a sequel, sometimes they don't really mesh or it's like a copy of a copy of a copy. You have degradation to the characters in the way that they were in the first book versus the second book or the third book. They seem like lesser identity matched to themselves, it seems like. Because of that, I just, it takes me out of a book so quick. It makes it so hard to finish, but that's not the case with this. If anything, it seems like he's had more time to delve into these characters and make them more rich. Like Grayland the Second or Cardinia, for example. Her character, oh boy, she is becoming a force. She may not have been raised like her brother to take over this empire. She's not an idiot. She's not a fool. She knows what's happening around her. Her ability to manipulate a situation whenever she needs to is just un parallel. She's got this little friend of hers, Mars. There's a couple of scenes between him and her in it that are quite joyous as well. The overall thing of the book is that they do set that expedition that was in the first book being talked about into play and they go to star system that had been closed off for 800 years or so. And whenever they get there, they do meet what has survived. There's a group of people that have evolved over 800 years, more into like little goblin type creatures than what we think of as human. We find out what they've been up to, what's been going on there. And then there's another ship that's met. This ship is the new character that I mentioned. Instead of writing an AI as an AI, John wrote this AI as a person. Especially the way that he was implemented in there. It wasn't just this... It was a cheap copy and it's only limited to this and it can only do that. It, it was a fully functioning emotional individual and it has a fairly unique sense of humor as well. They meet the alien race, they come back, they bring the new ship that's from a different place back to meet Cardinia. Cardinia, whenever she meets the ship's AI, Shinever, they both do this big elaborate bow in front of Mars and Mars is like, uh, what gives? What's going on here? And she's like, your friend here, he's a king. Shinever was indeed a king of one one of the areas before the interdependency. We also find out what was going on with the flow, who was probably responsible for it having issues. But there's a little bit of backstory too. Apparently the interdependency has lost all their knowledge of anything before this one catastrophic event. And Shinovert was a excellent device to use because he ends up giving some of the information back to the people that enter dependency on this is what happened and there's not just you guys ironically enough you guys were the ones that had no planets just a bunch of things to mine the interdependency that thought of themselves as regal come to find out that's not what they really are in a lot of ways they ended up almost being the back roads cousins i thought that was a really really interesting little tidbit that got sprinkled in it is sci-fi and that was funny speaking of mars there was hittide royonald which was somebody that the Emperor Cardinia or Grayland the Second, she was actually halfway kind of jealous about with Mars taking this woman with him to go do the expedition in the first place. And that was a funny scene altogether with his own description of it being that she just views my flesh as being this thing she has to deal with so that she would be able to talk to his brain. Mars goes on the first expedition where he meets the, the people that have evolved. Now, if it hadn't been for her being there, Mars probably would have been killed. Hatid would have been a good mental companion for Mars, but she's not an important mover of the story because it seems like she's always on the coat hills and she had one contributing thing to give being that sure your data is right you've missed this one critical element this is where we run into that other ship somebody's getting ready to hack into the computer systems whenever the ship's ai comes on line and introduces themselves as shinever they play a game of cat and mouse with the would-be assassins they do get themselves back in the system of the interdependency by hub i know that i'm 
just glancing over that whole section, really. But I want to glance over that section. I don't want to give you all the information about it. That was a well done thing. It was a well done scene. If I get into all that and I describe those people and everything that has to do with them, I feel like I would be taking away from you. All these other houses were so used to dealing with particular emperors in the past that were easily stroked by ego into doing what the houses would want or bribed or whatever. Grayland the second slash Cardinia slash Impro, she has a way of playing dumb. Well, maybe not playing dumb, but she does sandbag until they make their little ruse to whatever they want to do. And then she'll just shut them down completely. And of course, that's like a one trick pony, right? It's only going to happen one time. It can only work one time. But she pulls it off on multiple houses in the same house multiple times. Talking about trickery, let's get back around to Kiva. Kiva Largo. What a character. She's still at her antics. Cardinia puts her in a position where she's going to be over the Nohama Petons pretty much. The Countess of the Nohama Petons is pretty, pretty riled about Kiva being put into the position that she was. And that is that Cardinia put Kiva into trying to root out the evils of the Nohama Petons finances. There's a very big screw up. Basically, the count of the Nohama Petons decided that she was going to assassinate Kiva. <sighs> And that doesn't go so well. Kiva's Kiva. She actually kind of starts to, seems like, have feelings for the lawyer. Kind of unique. One night, whenever they were in bed together, there's an assassination attempt. And instead of Kiva being killed, it was actually the lawyer that got hit by the bullet. Now, don't worry, the lawyer didn't die. Kiva gets really mad at this point. Decides that, well, now I'm going to get motivated. She goes and she punches a few noses. And the person that was getting their nose punched in was correct. There's a or. But Kiva just really beat the living crap out of this person's face. Whenever she was the person that was being attacked, asked or, there was no answer. He was like, there is no or. This is just how it is. And then punched her again. Things kind of flip a little bit. One of the scenes that's following is that Cardinia is having a meeting with the Countess and has, of course, Kiva there, and where the House of Nohama Peton was going to try to put all this stuff off on Kiva, saying, well, since she's been here, we've had so many issues and we've had a lot of sabotage, and Cardinia squashes that before the Countess even has an opportunity to say or do anything about it. And in fact, instead of letting it get to where Kiva would be outed, puts her into the position even more firmly. Of course, everybody knows that it was the Nohama Petons that tried to kill Cardinia and is responsible for her friend's death. Kiva was the one that had found where all these warehouses were empty and there was really no money. That they would be having a banner year if it wasn't for all the theft, no money. Now, let's get back to Cardinia and to Mars. Mars is kind of resigned to not actually getting married to Cardinia. He feels like he's going to be a fling because he's not worthy. But Cardinia really digs on this Mars character. She really likes him. He seems to be a genuine individual and he's unique and he doesn't really have a problem treating her like a normal individual, which I guess I could kind of understand. If somebody were to be putting me on a pedestal all the time, I don't think that would be a very interesting relationship whatsoever. So I can see where she's coming from. There's this push that's happening by the, the Nohama Petons to do the same thing that the Woos, which is Cardinia's family, did a long time ago. They're operating off of a false pretense. They think that the flow is going to move to end the last world and that will become the new hub and the whole reason why hub is called hub is because that's where all the flow points come and go to now remember hatid hatid that i had mentioned earlier her math on this flow problem being a flow physicist originally she thought that the flow was going to shift to a new place that's the information that the nohama petons are operating off of but that information's wrong because she didn't have anybody to check her math. Whenever she got the rest of the documents from Mars and his father, and she redid the calculation, she realized, yes, I was wrong. It is going to end, but there's going to be this event that happens afterwards where things will open and close and open and close until it finally just goes away. But if we want, we can probably work out a plan to get everybody to end. Cardinia realizes that this is what the Nomahama Petons are pushing for. They want to get themselves institutionalized at end. That's the reason why they disassociated themselves from that entire system that was theirs, their home system, and left all those people behind. Is because they wanted to get a duke on the planet so that whenever everybody started coming in, they could charge exorbitant prices for being on the only planet in those systems that has air that's breathable and that people could live. Remember in the first video where I made that example about a priest? I hadn't read this book yet whenever I did that. That was just a random happenstance because that was 
it was just the best example I could think of of a character being well wrote or not well wrote with their behavior was a priest well funnily enough in this one there's a kid that in the very beginning of the book has a religious vision and throughout his life it goes from it's a religious vision to moving on in his own life to the point of where it was no uh it's a I'm using antidote now. It's not something that's actual. Whenever Cardinia decided that she's going to revamp the church and give this huge religious speech, that guy that had kind of lost his way drops the F-bomb. Again, credit to John Scalzi for the way that he even did that. And you know what? I had said that if there was one instance where a person did something, if they continuously did this, but they were supposed to be this person, then it wouldn't be true to their character. Well, in the way that John Scalzi wrote this, it was indeed true to that character. And if I could just get a crowbar to get that foot out of my mouth, we'll move on. It was a decent read it was a good read i would certainly certainly recommend reading this book definitely fun it's exciting it's got a lot of action it's got good dialogue choices as well good character development is continuing the characters are actually getting more in depth i'm starting to sound like a fanboy aren't i well it's not really that way people that write are the same as anybody else they're just people but i do respect what he's done with this i'm curious to see what he's going to do with the next one again today's book was the consuming fire by John Scalzi. Like, share, subscribe. This is Shane with Shane's Books and Review, and I will see you on Monday.